you called President Trump a white supremacist this week. What does that say about the millions of people who voted for him? Look, this is about the president and his responsibility. We have a president of the United States who called uh, white supremacists in Virginia fine people. A president bears real responsibility for his leadership. And Donald Trump doesn't get to get off the hook on that. Elizabeth Warren today in Iowa. Well, if nothing else, the following is thought-provoking. New reporting from Axios today revealing that President Trump's allies welcome Democrats calling the president a white supremacist in this way. And we quote, Trump campaign officials and sources close to the president tell Axios that they believe Democrats' extraordinary charge that the president is a white supremacist will actually help him win in 2020. These Trump allies tell us that the claim by Democratic opponents is not only emboldening his base, but also alienating some mainstream Republicans who think Democrats have gone too far. Earlier today, the president addressed being labeled a white supremacist by some of the Democrats. Does Democrats call you and your supporters a white nationalist and the white supremacist help you? I don't think it helps. First of all, I don't like it when they do it because I am not any of those things. I think it's a disgrace. And I think it shows how desperate the Democrats are. Well, let's talk about it tonight with two journalists in the thick of it, starting with Jackie Alimany, political reporter for The Washington Post and the author, uh, author of the paper's morning newsletter, appropriately called Power Up, and Eliza Collins, politics reporter covering the 2020 campaign for The Wall Street Journal. Jackie, what do you think is more unusual? Um, the fact that Democrats are saying the president is a white supremacist or the fact that people in his orbit are saying we're fine with that. It gives us something to fight back on. I think if we take a step back here, I'm not sure anyone would have expected in 2015 for the entire field of, you know, 20 plus Democratic candidates to be calling the president of the United States uh, a white supremacist. That is a startling um, fact in and of itself. Uh, and I would say the more predictable line here is that his campaign believes this is good for Trump, just in the way that they believe that impeaching the president would be good for the president electorally as well, because it helps further the, this partisan divide uh, and helps the president with this message that he's been fueling through either explicitly racist language or through more coded language, which is that, you know, the subsidiary of Republicans versus Democrats being this is a racial battle, uh, you know, whites versus um, minorities, invaders, all of this really damaging rhetoric that the president has been consistently using. Um, but, you know, at the, at the end of the day, I, I can't quite see uh, practically the means um, that or, or what exactly the Democratic candidates hope to achieve by calling the president a white supremacist other than it checking off a box. I'm not sure necessarily there's any Republicans out there who are going to hear, uh, you know, Elizabeth Warren call Trump a white supremacist and, and therefore change their minds. Eliza, same question, though. I imagine neither option is great for our country. Right. Well, I think Jacqueline's point about Republicans being swayed either way on this, I think those sort of mainstream Republicans that the Trump campaign is arguing it will help them with. I have my doubts. This president has done all sorts of things. And if they're sticking with him or they've left him, they're probably not going to be swayed. But what Democrats do risk with the white supremacist comment, and this might be what the campaign is sort of clinging on to, is what happened in 2016 when Hillary Clinton called some of the president's supporters deplorable. And the Trump Trump campaign really used that and said she thinks that you are deplorable and for voting for this person. And it really emboldened his base. And I think Trump supporters are hoping that something like this will they can open it up to the base by saying, you know, by saying that this president that you support is a white supremacist, they're saying that you are white supremacists. Now, I, we saw Elizabeth Warren. She is not saying that. Democrats are not saying that. They are being very careful to push this right at the president's feet only. But that is a risk. And I think that is something that the president's allies might be sort of hoping they can do with these comments. Jackie, tell us about your reporting on Charlie Cook. I'm going to go ahead and assume that most folks watching this channel at this hour on a Friday night know the name Charlie Cook. If they aren't subscribers, they know that the Cook Political Report has been one of the Bibles of political reporting in this country over decades. What is he prepared to declare? Yeah, well, and actually, I, I think our, our 
conversation about the term white supremacy really um, segues perfectly into this conversation. Uh, so what Charlie Cook is arguing in the 2020 po uh, political almanac is that uh, the president's actually more of an underdog than I think people are assuming, despite, you know, a lot of the uh, Democratic bedwetting, hand-wringing, um, and a, a lot of the political columnists who have been saying, you know, this election's a done deal, Democrats have lurched too far left, and the president's incumbency advantage is, is too great to overcome. But actually, uh, a lot of the historical factors that worked to the president's advantage um, are unlikely to be repeated this time around. Uh, and one of those being that is that the president was, uh, you know, it was a historically unfavorable candidate running against a historically unfavorable candidate, all-time lows. Um, that's not going to happen again. Hillary Clinton is not in the race. It's the, what, you know, uh, Charlie Cook referred to as the Hillary factor. Um, there's also uh, the fact that it's unlikely that the president um, would win the Electoral College again uh, without winning the popular vote. That was the first time in 140 years that that had happened. Um, and then there's also this idea that the president's approval ratings are really fixed. Um, and that's where I think this white supremacy argument comes into play. There are a fixed amount of people to roughly 35 percent who are solidly on the president's side, no matter what he does, no matter what he's called, called he's their Trump supporters. Then there's this 45 percent which are firmly opposed to the president. So that leaves about a 20 percent, you know, um, uh, portion of the electorate that is the swing, or the consists of swing voters. Um, and it's these people who I think that, you know, the president is going to have to go beyond speaking to his base in order to attract. He's going to have to win about two thirds of those in order to beat Democrats. Um, and Democrats as well are going to have to, you know, potentially temper their rhetoric in order to attract that 20 percent. And Eliza, what is the 30 second version of what's going on with Bernie Sanders and his campaign. Well, Bernie Sanders is one of the candidates that Republicans are saying is too far left out of the mainstream. But what he has really done is he has kind of created that what he was talking about in 2016 has actually become a reality for much of the field. And so he's not necessarily very unique. And while he is in second or third place in most polls, he's not really rising. But we are seeing people like Elizabeth Warren, who has very similar policies. She is rising. So Sanders is trying to kind of do something different here. And one one of those things is actually talking about himself. So looking at all these candidates, a lot of politicians are able to tell their personal story. You know, I've been to a lot of these speeches. They talk about growing up lower class or, you know, their parents struggling um, to make ends meet. This is something Bernie Sanders has does not talk about a lot, but is starting to to sort of distinguish himself. He is um, his father was an immigrant from Poland. And so we saw him talk about it this week with this anti-immigrant um, manifesto coming out of the El Paso shooting. He was connecting that saying, you know, I know what it's like to grow up in an immigrant family. And it's something that is really rare for Bernie Sanders. And so we may be seeing that more as he tries to stand out. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.